victim Me? is uh, Jennifer Steen. She's a former hand model. Let's see you move. Very nice. Jennifer serves as a digital project delivery specialist at WSP, where she helps guide the development of BIM and 3D models in transportation and infrastructure. Her areas of emphasis include roadway and civil design, project management, and software training. Along with her desire to push the industry forward with technology, she also participates in her local Toastmaster club. So we're going to see if those skills uh, Let's try. <laughs> are, are so thank you. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Steen and I'm from WSP and today I really want to talk about the word digital twins and how this relates to BIM because everybody loves fun words. <laughs> so this is a great quote from um, our Buckmaster Fuller. So in order to change an existing paradigm, you do not struggle to try and change the problematic model. You create a new model and make the old one obsolete. But there's a transition period like we've, we've been talking about. So today I want to go through and we've defined BIM pretty well, but now we're going to go talk about more about the digital twins and where we are now and how does it impact us as an industry and what, what can we do to move forward with these digital twins. So in 2018 and 19, um, Gartner came out and said that digital twin is one of the top 10 technology trends. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen the graphs that have um, Civil engineering, we're at the bottom of moving technology. I think agriculture now beats us out, which is kind of sad. But in all the other um, industries that are out there, they're using digital twins in a production type environment. But like we were talking about that each project's different. That's why we don't really have this process down for digital twins yet. But now the technology is changing. We have the internet of things. We have a lot of data. We have all this cool visualization stuff and apps that we can use. And we've kind of been moving away from the drawing board and going more into the computers and our technology and software. Some of the other trends in the industry, I'm sure everybody here has seen this graph, but we are here in a kind of like in the level two, we, we're getting to that BIM, we're doing that IFC, so we're moving into this level three transition of the life cycle of all of our, our technology. And then just today, the industry, like everybody's heard of everyday counts, there's been a lot of presentations today using the information that's gone from there, but also anybody here as a kid, they probably have a YouTube channel like mine does. He's six. And they all play video games and that's where the industry is going. Gen Z and, and millennials, that's what we're all using. We're using YouTube to learn things. We're using apps on our phone. We think if you went to the color one, everybody probably downloaded like three apps there and we all want to try them out. And that's how we're learning and using technology. And so we have to start adapting our two-way or, or 2D plan sets into this new technology. So what is BIM? I think we kind of defined this. It's not just a 3D model. It's definitely the process. And the 3D model is like an outcome of the process. It's taking all this data in and how do you develop that into the 3D world? I think one of the biggest things is, is the communication that we can talk about when you're using a model. And it makes that data relatable to people. If you just have databases of information, no one's going to want to read that. I think no one wants to read a slide that just has numbers all over it. But if you show them, a visualization, whether it's at a public info center or sitting in a meeting to look at where the utilities are, that's more impactful. I think that definitely applies to data visualization. So that's what BIM is. So digital twin, getting to the, the crux of everything. It's a digital representation. It can be a product. You can do a digital twin of a service. You can do it of infrastructure or a system. You can have a digital twin that's small and complex or erroneous and, and very large, have a lot of data in there. But the point of a digital twin is that it's constant monitoring and feedback. So you're constantly putting data in and analyzing it and maintaining it. And that's the biggest difference, I think, between the BIM process, where I think a lot of times right now what we're doing is we're creating that 3D model and we hand it off and it just stops. Sometimes it might go to asset management, but really the digital twin is a living thing. You're constantly putting information in and getting information out. So this is kind of the life cycle of a digital twin. So you start in the development, you start putting some information in, you either build your existing model or your process or your product. 
And then you want to monitor it. So the big monitoring thing is that if you put um, sensors on it, you can start monitoring what data is out there. So in, for traffic, if you go out and you put um, sensors all over the road and you built it, the, your existing roadway and now you have the sensors coming in, you're getting data. And then what you can do is you can start simulating stuff. You can say, hey, what happens if we change the lights on this? Based off the sensor data that we got this morning, you can optimize stuff and then make changes without going out into the field and making expensive changes right away. You'll be able to make, simulate the right one. And then once you do that, you're operating it, but then it also comes back to the circle and you keep putting more data in. So that's what the digital twin is really focusing on. So for transportation infrastructure, it's, BIM is a little bit different with, with the digital twin. Usually with um, digital twins in like a production, let's say like in the beer industry, if you take your whole process and you're going through and you can look at, at your, um, your brewery and you have sensors on all of your tanks and where the water goes through and you're, you're monitoring how fast you're putting out your product. You, that's all simulated and now you can estimate things on that. And so that's a constant digital twin and they're constantly monitoring that. But in transportation, we don't have that existing data yet. I think that's kind of what we're all doing now is when we're building our new bridges or our new roads, we're building that existing digital twin. So we're starting kind of out right now using BIM. So this is kind of like where we're going from like the concept design to design, construction, and then the operation and maintenance and the end of the life cycle. So if we're building a bridge, for example, we're gonna start using, I'll we'll use all plan. We'll build a bridge and all plan <laughs> uh, software. And so now we have that and we put sensors on it when we go out there and build that. We can now maintain the bridge and then make any changes later on, looking at whether it's maintenance or figuring out or optimizing something later. If someone, someone hits the bridge, how can we fix that? So there's lower costs. And then you update your digital twin with that information. So it's a living object, your, your model. And then you can start doing machine learning and, and predictive maintenance in case something over time, something happens. And now you can look at that while instead of just guessing or looking at a database of stuff. So that's what you can be using your digital twins. So why now? So why is now so important? I think um, 2019, like, um, you said that it's you know, an impactful year. I think in the next five years, it's really impactful for, for us because with technology, you know, it's industry 4.0. We're right now, we're in the middle of that. It's that manufacturing revolution. It's taking the computers that we have, which was industry 3.0, and now we're getting more data and more software and, and more stuff in there. And it, it's really a revolution. You know, we're constantly innovating and changing we sat down and talked about all the, the BIM studies that we want to do with TRB, but, if you, but the length of time that it takes is like 18 months. Things change in those 18 months. We're changing so quickly, and there's all this innovation, so we need to be taking advantage of that. All of the technology and, and emerging tech, we should be using that, and, and now is the time. But then we also need to maintain and build the models now while we're using all this technology so we can reap the benefits later. We're saying that you know we're still in that 2D, 3D kind of transition. Once it becomes 3D, we need to have all these models already built. And once you have that now, now in the future, it'll be easier. So it's kind of like looking ahead at why we want to do this now. So some of the benefits of creating these models and maintaining it. I think that's the biggest thing is we don't want to just hand off our models to a client and then they don't use it for anything. You can use this for tons of different things. I mean, this is all the possibilities, and we probably realize that of putting all of this data in. You know, you're going to be able to improve those decision-making um, things and, and then the efficiency of making those decisions. You can link to the real world with those sensors that I was talking about. So if you start doing all of that, think all of that data. Think of all of it. Now you can put that into your um, dashboards and constantly monitor it. All the cool stuff. We have a lot of big data, the Internet of Things and AI, everything is connecting. And so now we're getting more connected um, cities and vehicles and it's all coming together and all building in. And then you're going to help reduce those maintenance costs. And then you can also apply all these what if analysis, uh, analyses and, and scenarios. So you can say, hey, what if we did X, Y, and Z? Let's check this out using our digital twin. Um, a lot of places are doing, cities are doing a digital twin of their entire city because now they can look at what happens at 
the environment or what happens if there's a flood, what's going to happen to all of this stuff and how does that impact everything? And now they can make choices on what they maintain or if they need to take something down or if you know, a flood's coming in, where are they going to, to put up walls or anything? So it's, it's a lot easier to do a what-if scenario digitally than it is to build like an actual like little 3D model and pour water on it or um, go out and change something and realize that wasn't the best idea. So where is the T&I industry right now? So I think everybody's gone to all of the different talks this, this today and yesterday about, you know, there's sensors out there, all the, the um, drones, we have BIM, we have that 3D model for construction in a connected environment. Um, you can do a, a 3D model and design in a connected environment too. So in construction, you can go and put sensors on everything and see where all of your cranes are. And so now you can make decisions based off of that. And you can use the drones and fly over, you know, every, every day and see the change of what's being constructed. So it's all connected. So how does this impact me? How, does, how is this going to change my job? You're going to see a lot more smart cities and urban planning. I think we've all looked at how does that data transfer into the urban planning and making the changes. Um, just transportation and construction, like I was saying, on the construction sites. Put sensors there and make a model of your construction site. Um, and then in business development, too. That's where it's going to impact you. It's how are you going to go win work? How do you go, how does a client go and look and say, we have 10 bridges, we don't know which one we should look at. If we had models of each of these and had figured out over the next 20 years when to do each one, that's going to help them manage their money and where their, their budgets are going to go. So this is kind of similar to, to, uh, to the BIM workflow, but, but how much should you use it? What should you use it for? You know, is it necessary when you're sitting on every project, do we have to build this out to the fullest extent? You know, what is the outcome of the digital twin? You know, the same thing as when you're planning out how you want to teach everybody. What's the outcome of your, of, uh, your um, twin? So you have to also look, the next thing is about cost, security, privacy, and integration. So we want everything to be open source, that everybody can use it, whether, and, and um, IFC is, is a big one. Privacy is another concern, because if we're putting these models out there, and people are using it or using the data, um, it comes into the security about it. So that's another big concern that people are going to have to start looking into when using a lot of this big data. And the cost. Who's going to maintain it? So your model, your digital twin, someone has to be there and, and either inputting the sensors or monitoring it and then coming up with those different decisions. So people cost money <laughs> to sit there. So that's another thing when you're looking at what are you going to use it for? And then you can't underestimate the complexity and maintenance of that digital twin. So just how complex it is. Someone just can't say, oh, can you just, you know, just make a BIM model, make a digital twin. It's okay. Just go do that. And you're like, sure, I'll press the magic button. It magically appears. So what do we need to do now? I'm going to talk really quick about some like the deliverables, open technology, leveraging the process, and then adapting it to our industry and how are we going to change uh, civil engineering. <laughs> So our deliverables, they used to be our 2D plans. We still have to do them right now, but we're changing the way. I think that's what our biggest step of the past you know, couple of years is, is changing how we're producing the plans. Maybe they aren't going to be printed out on paper, but they're going to be PDFs instead, or you're only going to have a couple plans with information. You're not going to have the 1,500-page plan set that you're going to go out in the field. Um, deliverables also can go on to tablets. You can go out in the field, and that's a lot. Uh, less weight to carry that than it is a, a roll plot where they're going to tape everything together on the back of a truck. So all of our deliverables are starting to change. And then our, our deliverables and open technology. We need to be open with how we pull all of our data together, whether it's in a model and, and, and software agnostic almost. And then you brought up the point about QCing your models and how do you review them and how do you look at them. So there's a lot of new technology that's coming out and being built um, that we can create um, an open ecosystem, basically. So how are we going to leverage this process? We need to really like adapt to the data-driven workflows. But it's also coming back with the 2D to 3D workflows. How are we going to make workflows that 
you're not spending a whole lot of time and money making the workflows because we know that it's all going to be a 3D workflow later, but how are we going to adapt between the three stages of everything, especially when projects are still making 2D plans for a while? I and mean, you have a new project that's coming out that's going to go all 3D. So what's, where's the step in between? So we have to make our workflows and, and teach that to everybody. Um, design review changes. That's a big one. Had, like I mentioned before, it's QCing those models, but just reviewing the data. So when you're building your twin or your, your BIM model, how do you, how is that going to change our reviews? Are you going, still going to do checklists? Are you going to, who's going to sign off? Who's responsible? I think making people more responsible for the models is, is what needs to come into play. And once you have built everything, you can do this real-time visualization, which we've seen here at the, the conference. Um, just all the cool things that you can do as an output from all this data. And then just leveraging this whole process to create new opportunities, whether it's new jobs, whether it's um, adapting to something. So, you know, like the CAD drafters, they've got to change what they do. We're not getting rid of people, but we just have to adapt to new opportunities. So just think of like what you could possibly do. And then adapting to the industry. The industry is all about the public, and I think just people in general, um, when, when you, public outreach is the biggest thing. How are people going to look at all of this data and then realize they have to collaborate and all the stakeholders? Funding, we have to invest in new technology and workflows and workspaces. I think DOTs are seeing this, like how are they going to move forward with a new software product? A new, they have to change their ways. How are they going to spend their you know, training budgets and get funding, enough funding to do this? So how are they going to take a look at, at all of these different changes? It's a wholesale culture change too. You need to get the buy-in and, and to set those standards and you gotta get people excited about this. Because if you, you show them the cool things that they can do with it and that it doesn't take too many steps to get there, they're gonna be um, more willing to make the change or being able to get over the, that little hump of fear that everybody has for change. And then it's also training and expertise. It's finding the talent and that knowledge sharing and the, the champions out there. And if you have champions to help push it, that's how we're going to succeed with all of this. I think everybody here is probably the champions um, at their place of business, so keep it up. And last but not least, if anybody has any questions, but, but just ponder, you know, like, how do you really feel about all of these changes? The word digital twin, you know, is that just a buzzword that you think it is? Or, or do you think that digital twins are going to become one of the, the, the mainstream into to civil engineering? Or is it going to just stay BIM for, <laughs> whether BIM for infrastructure? We still never can come up with a word, right? But, and are you preparing your organizations for these bigger, models that have to be maintained through the life cycle of uh, the product and the product being like let's say a bridge a bridge is a life cycle of 100 years how who's going to maintain that so anybody pondering anything <laughs> very good we have two minutes left again show off anybody actually two minutes and 20 seconds right? any questions Um, I want to say, I think, I think one, I want to say something over Europe. I think London was trying to do it, maybe. I'd have to go back and look. No, but it's, a, so it's cl it Yeah, it's like climate. looking at climate. Especially when it comes to um, underground facilities. Mm -hmm. And Philadelphia for the staples. Yeah, pa yeah. you start building up, you I want to use it for this, and these are all the other things I can use it for. So they start doing like looking at the climate stuff, and then they build out to, to other things. Are there examples of IoTs being used for privacy? We just talked about it. Like putting sensors on things? Yeah, I mean, what kind of issues are you Um, I mean, there's so many different examples for that. I think the traffic side that I was talking about is going to be the biggest, easiest one to put on like signs and maintaining. Um, oh, Connor, is it? Uh, 
for help models be attached to the 3D model so that you're able to visualize uh, that information. Uh, I would, the 3D model. I would say University is all so they took something uh, fully implemented a uh, sensory bridge that was built mostly eight years ago and a big question and and massaging that data so I can see the content. Express like tolls too. I mean, this bridge is instrumented. It's a bridge engineer with what they uh, everything that we You can also look at like autonomous vehicles that are coming out, or what sensors are going to put the roads for that, and that's just going to collect more data, and you can pull that into any twin. Right. That's the biggest reason why 5G is coming out for yeah. autonomous vehicles. You can't have your data drop yeah. when you're an autonomous vehicle. Thank <laughs> you.